everyone. How are you today? We are back for another Bible story reading. And for those of you joining for the first time, one of these videos, I'd like to tell you what we do here. We go through different stories of the Bible. And we tell the stories for people, we just read the stories for people who have never heard them, don't know what they are, have forgotten them. Whatever the case is, we give you an opportunity to know the stories of the Bible. We've been going through the story of David becoming king. We are in 2 Samuel. We're going to take a break today, um, and we're actually going to read one of the Psalms that David wrote. Now, many of you may not know this, but David wrote many of the Psalms. They are, the Psalms were, were put to music, they were poetic, they were just things from David's heart and other writers' hearts that they poured out to God. They were laments, they were joys, they were all sorts of things. This particular one we are going to read is Psalm 34. Now, they think David wrote this concerning the time that he pretended to be insane. If you remember, we told this story. David was trying to escape from Saul, and he goes to this one place that he thinks he's going to be safe, but Abimelech, the king there, is like, you know, I don't, I don't know about this David guy, and um, they, they bring him David, and David realizes, hmm, if I stay here, Saul's going to find me, and my life is going to be in danger. So he pretends to be insane. He starts spitting on himself, and he acts like a crazy guy. And Abimelech is like, get rid of this guy. He's an idiot. So they get rid of him. They drive him out. And David escapes and he runs away. Well, they think this is one of the psalms that David wrote regarding that particular instance. So we are going to read it. And I'll, I'll tell you what made me think of it. As I was in church this morning, just a blip of something that our pastor said. He reminded us to taste of the Lord and see that he is good. And so I went looking for where that might be and found out that was something that David wrote. We are going to read the 34th Psalm. I will bless the Lord all, at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will boast in the Lord. The humble will hear and be glad. Proclaim the Lord's greatness with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he answered me and rescued me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant with joy. Their faces will never be ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him from all his troubles. The angels of the Lord, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and rescues them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. How happy is the person who takes refuge in him. You who are his holy ones, fear the Lord. For those who fear him lack nothing. Young lions lack food and go hungry. But those who seek the Lord will not lack any good thing. Come, children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Who is someone who desires life, loving a long life to enjoy what is good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from deceitful speech. Turn away from evil and do what is good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their cry for help. The face of the Lord is set against those who do what is evil to remove all memory of them from the earth. The righteous cry out and the Lord hears and rescues them from all their troubles. The Lord is near the brokenhearted. He saves those crushed in spirit. One who is righteous has many adversities, but the Lord rescues him from them all. He protects all his bones. Not one of them is broken. Evil brings death to the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be punished. The Lord redeems the life of his servants, and all who take refuge in him will not be punished. And that is the end of Psalm 34. It's such a beautiful psalm, isn't it? There are three ways that we look at scripture when we are reading it, when we read these stories and these, these passages. 
What does it say? We have to have reading comprehension. If you've never read it, you don't know what it says. So we read it. What was it saying to the people of the time? What was the culture and the history? What was the importance of it back then? And what, if anything, is it saying to us today? So we just read, Psalm, uh, uh, David writes this beautiful psalm. He's excited. He's singing praises and joy to the Lord. He's telling them, come and I'm going to teach you that the Lord is good. I have tasted of the Lord and he is good. Taste and see, it says in 34a, taste and see that the Lord is good. Well, how in the world are we going to taste the Lord? I mean, we're not cannibals, right? We don't, we don't taste people. We don't eat them. I don't know. When my grandchildren were born, I did taste their little feet. Num, num, num. But I, I don't think that's the point that, that David is making in this psalm. How many times have we talked about, boy, once you get a taste of, you'll never want to go back to. Once you get a taste of the good life, oh, it's hard to go back. Once you've developed a taste for caviar, you might like caviar. Caviar is something that my husband and kids eat every Thanksgiving, and I will tell you, I have not developed a taste for it, although they have. Ugh, I don't like it. They do. But what does he mean, taste of the Lord and see that he is good? Too many of you are going to church maybe on Sundays or watching videos like this or listening to sermons, and you're going through it like a buffet line, and you're looking at it and you're going, oh, that looks like a lovely dish. Oh, that looks like a lovely dish. Oh, look at the colors of that dish. But you are not tasting it. And you are being presented with all of these wonderful things that the Lord has to offer you. But you have not tasted of them. You may have read the stories. You may have read the Bible. And maybe sometimes you remember to say a prayer for somebody. Lord, please heal Aunt Betty. In Jesus' name, amen. But have you tasted of the Lord? Have you seen that he is good? David goes on to talk about how happy is the person that takes refuge in him. You know, David says some wonderful things here that, that if we turn away from evil and do what is good and we seek peace, that the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. They're on the righteous. The face of the Lord is set against those whose ways are evil, but they are on the righteous. You know, I don't think we can deny that sometimes life gets tough. Bad things happen. They really do. You know, when, when you're starting to come down with a cold, people usually say to you, oh, you better start pumping up on that vitamin C. Make sure you get plenty of fluid. Make sure you drink some fluid. It doesn't necessarily mean that you won't still have that cold or you won't still be sick, but you have a a better chance at boosting your immune system so you can get through that cold, so you can get through being sick. In a bit, you know, that you can be stronger to endure the sickness or the, the illness that is on you. Well, if you didn't have the, the vitamin C and the liquids to pump up on, how much more miserable would you be in that sickness? So he's saying here, taste and see that the Lord is good. He isn't saying that all situations are good, but David learned to praise the Lord even when times were tough, even when he was running from Saul. So he's running from Saul, and he manages to escape. And instead of going, Whew, boy, did I get lucky, he says, wow, God helped me escape. How wonderful is the Lord? How much better I am getting through these miserable situations because I have tasted of the Lord. I've been in communion with him. I've been in relationship with him. I've turned to him. I've trusted in him. He is my dose of vitamin C. So when I start to feel like I'm coming down with a cold, I can, I can fight it off so much better. He says, one who is righteous has many adversities. So nowhere in here does it say that you won't have adversities just because you are with the Lord. You know, he's walking right beside you in all of those things. He sees everything you're going through. He doesn't tell you that you're not going to have him. The next sentence says, but the Lord rescues him from them all. He protects all his bones. Not one of them is broken. Well, Laura, I've had broken bones before, you might be telling me. That doesn't make any sense. I think David is speaking here 
in a spiritual sense, and, and he is relating this specifically to what happened to him. You're not going to believe this. I was just delivered from the hand of Saul. Things could have been much... Look at me. I, I'm all in one piece. This is amazing. He didn't say it's amazing because I got lucky. It's amazing because I'm smart-witted and I outwitted Saul. No, he says it's amazing because God has taken care of me. He protects the ones that he loves. The Lord redeems the life of his servants and all who take refuge in him will not be punished. We know that sometimes seemingly bad stuff happens in this world. But if we take refuge in God, when we make mistakes, when we have failures, we are not going to be punished for them. We will be forgiven. We are forgiven when we go to the Lord and we ask him for forgiveness. I'm, I'm imploring you today, taste of the Lord. He is good. Make him your best friend. You know, when I, when I first started out on my journey of having a relationship with the Lord, I wanted to be like David. I wanted to find the heart of God. I wanted to seek after the heart of God. And I didn't know how to have a relationship with God because we can't see him with our eyes. We can feel him with our heart. We can sense his presence. We can see his activity in the different things that may happen in our lives, even when they are bad or seemingly bad. So one of the things that I did is I created this opportunity for God to be a presence in my life so that I could taste of him and see that he was good, get a taste of God. And I spend a lot of time by myself. My husband has a job that um, keeps him gone for several days, and so I would spend a lot of time by myself. And I, I started deciding, you know what? I want God to be my best friend. He said he would never leave me. He's not going to forsake me. I want him to be my best friend. So I would set a pl an extra plate at the table at dinner time. And that was God's plate. And I would talk to him. When I was a little girl, I was probably four years old. And I actually remember some of this. I had imaginary sons. <laughs> they were my imaginary friends. And they were Scott and Randy. <laughs> I don't know why that was their names, but they were. They were my imaginary friends. But to me, they were real. They had personalities. One of them was a bad kid, and the other one was a good one. And, and I was their mom, and oh, it drove my mother crazy that I had these imaginary friends. <laughs> but I did. And so as I became an adult, and I'm setting this plate for God that I can't see with my eyes, I started having conversations with him. Look, if I could have conversations with imaginary friends, why not have a conversation with the living God? And it's amazing, but I began to hear him speak back to me. Not like you're hearing me right now. Uh, you know, I, I'm not schizophrenic. I don't hear voices. But in my spirit, in my heart, I started having thoughts about doing things ways that I had never done them before. You know, when I got mad at somebody, I decided I was going to take revenge on them. And then I started having this idea that maybe I shouldn't take revenge on them. My mind started to change. I became a different person. I started to taste of the Lord, and I started to see that he was good. And the things that he could get me through and the paths that he was going to lead me on were better than anything that I could have done for myself. It was good. And I can't imagine going back to eating hate and anger and discontent every moment of my life. That's what I was feeding on in my life. And the world told me I was completely justifiable. That, that I was completely justified in the things that I was angry about. The world told me that I had every right to be upset about the things that I was upset about. You know, God said to me, yes, you're allowed to be upset about those things. But if you want to do things my way and get rid of all of that anger and bitterness and fear and resentment, there's a much better way that you can go. And so little by little, God started to give me new directions, new ways to go. And I started to see that his ways were brighter, they were lighter, they're much easier to get through life with. Life no longer had all the drama in it that it used to have. Bad stuff still happens. People still die. Jobs still get lost. Money problems still happen. People I love still get sick. People I care about still have bad things happen to them. Sometimes people say mean things about me. I don't like that. Cars break down. Appliances break down, 
the house still needs clean, you know, stuff happens. But I get through those so much easier and so much calmer because I have tasted in the Lord and he is good. And the way that he tells me to handle things is so much better than the ways that I've handled them before in my past. So I invite you like David to look at things going on in your life and say, wow, God is getting me through this. I am still alive. God has not given up on me. He is close to the brokenhearted. He is near to the brokenhearted. Wow. Start praising God. Start being excited about God. And I promise that things will go much better in your life. I don't know that you learned much of a story today. The next time we get together, we are going to pick up with 2 Samuel chapter 2, and we're going to talk some more about David and his becoming king. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's video. Have a wonderful day, and God bless you.